Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful welcome and for your warm hospitality. It's been wonderful to be here back in Gordon College this week and to sense myself among friends old and new and not least among a large number of bright students who've been giving me lively questions for the last few days. I've been feeling myself as though I was a squash ball in a squash court with different people <laughs> um, hitting the ball this way and that. And perhaps there'll be more questions provoked this afternoon as well. Now, as you've heard, this lecture falls within the larger series today, or the larger seminar today, on hope in suffering. And it also, for me, falls within the larger train of thought, which I've been exploring this spring in the Gifford lectures, which I was doing in Aberdeen. And that, in turn, just so you can see the strange lineage of my thinking, goes back to my book, Simply Christian, which some of you will know, which I originally wrote in 2005. It's kind of funny now because I dedicated that book to my first two grandchildren who were born um, a few months apart in that year. And now that they're both, one of them is as tall as me already, I'm thinking, heavens, Simply Christian wasn't that long ago, was it? But it was. Um, now, the present lecture addresses the first of these things, hope in suffering, or suffering and hope, by addressing, at another level, the old puzzle of natural theology. Uh, I, uh, my mother is approaching her 95th birthday, and she asked me last year, I said, Tom, what are these funny lectures you're doing about, the Gifford lecture? I said, well, Mum, they're about natural theology. She doesn't mince her words. She said, said, natural theology, what's that? So I said, well, some people used to think you could start with the natural world and reason your way up to God, and a lot of people thought that actually isn't a very good idea, but I'm hoping that if we start with Jesus in his historical context, we might be able to bring the whole thing together and perhaps find out something about knowledge itself at the same time. I thought that's quite enough for somebody in their 90s. And she thought for a moment, and then she said, I'm glad I don't have to listen to those lectures. <laughs> <laughs> so... But the, the topic known as natural theology has taken various forms down the years and sometimes been very contentious, not only with people like my mother, but notoriously with the debate between Karl Barth and Emil Brunner in the 1930s, with Karl Barth recognizing the danger from the Nazi ideology that was saying God has raised up the German people to be the new beacon of salvation for the world. So you've just got to get on board with that, and that's Natural theology, Bart obviously rightly nailed that as a piece of serious idolatry, but the jury is still out as to whether in his eagerness to get rid of the bathwater, he threw out not only the baby, but the entire bathtub. There's a lot of puns to be made at that point, and I won't go there. <laughs> now, I faced these questions when I was writing Simply Christian 15 years ago this month, because my commission was to try to do for... Uh, 12 years ago this month, was, I can't remember. Anyway, um, my commission was to try to do for our day something like what C.S. Lewis had done in Mere Christianity. That was what the publishers said, which is kind of a tall order. Lewis began that book by thinking about the way in which all human beings believe in justice, but all human beings mess it up. And he was starting with evidence from within the natural world. This is something we all know. It's a difficult kind of argument to make because you're constantly on a knife edge. On the one hand, many apologists speak as if the world is full of signs of God's presence and all you have to do is to argue up from here, from the natural processes of the world, from human nature, the moral law, from the sun and the moon and the stars, and you'll figure out God eventually. In the early 18th century, a lot of people tried to do that, notoriously Bishop Joseph Butler. But by the late 18th century, this was deemed to be harder for all sorts of reasons, some of them good. And theologians have ever since pointed out that if you're starting your argument somewhere other than Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah and Lord, and his death and resurrection, then you are making Jesus simply a function of a larger set of truths rather than the very center and embodiment of truth itself. And one of the dangers then is that you're drawing attention away from the place where true hope is to be found, hope precisely in suffering. But on the other hand, if you say you're going to start with Jesus and work everything out from there, it looks easily as though you're creating a private world which has no intersection, no meeting point, no point of contact with the real world. And this sometimes looks as though it's generating 
a kind of a safe space, a smug, self-enclosed, even self-satisfied space where we know we're right and we don't even want to bother explaining it to people outside because they wouldn't understand anyway. I was discussing this problem with a Dutch friend not long ago and he said, in Holland, we sometimes say, Karl Barth has built a wonderful house, but there is no front door. And this, too, can seem to have the effect of removing the hope away from the world where there is real suffering. And this is the problem. How do we avoid these two dangers? And one of the reasons that it took me a long time to get down to writing Simply Christian was that I felt myself to be shuttling to and fro either side of that knife edge. But I eventually constructed the following argument. I took four features of human life, four things which I believe can be established throughout history and across cultures. All human beings wrestle with justice, spirituality, relationships, and beauty. These all constitute imperatives, which, as we say, we know in our bones that we ought to follow, but which turn out to be elusive and which we ourselves mess up, sometimes quite consciously. And so I then ask in Simply Christian what sense we can make of this. And I offer, as a sense-generating reality, the great story of Scripture, the story of God, Israel, Jesus, the Spirit, the world. And I then show how this story enables us to understand, in retrospect, as it were, that those four puzzling imperatives really were true signposts to reality. Echoes of a voice, the voice of God himself, and how the life of following Jesus in the power of the Spirit brings us back at last into true justice, refreshed spirituality, re restored relationships, and reawakened beauty. And thus I avoid, on the one hand, saying you just start with those signposts and work up from there, and I avoid, on the other hand, saying that you can start with Jesus and ignore the real world outside. There is a way that they go together, though finding that is as tantalizingly elusive as those echoes or signposts themselves. So what I want to do this afternoon, picking up some material from my recent Gifford lectures, is to extend the opening of the argument from four signposts to seven. You'll see them up on the board, so you'll be able to follow them, hopefully. I want to explain a bit more about how they now appear to be what I call broken signposts, and then to show how the cross of Jesus Christ a solid piece of historical evidence, literally stuck into our real world, functions the same way, only more so. And how from there, we find the launching pad for a kind of natural theology, which itself offers hope in the midst of suffering, but which deconstructs any attempt to use it in the service of arrogant human power. So to get us to the cross and its meaning, I want to start with one of the best loved of all gospel stories, Jesus talking to the two puzzled disciples on the road to Emmaus. Natural theology on the Emmaus road. You know how it goes. You are so senseless, Jesus says to the two disciples. You are so slow of heart to believe all the things that the prophets said to you. Don't you see, this is what had to happen. Now, that passage sums up the theological perspective, not only of Luke, but of all the early Christians. Some people have suggested Luke was out on a limb here, while Paul saw the idea of a scriptural backstory as irrelevant. But a strong case can be made for seeing Luke's point in, in the whole New Testament and in the mind and message of Jesus himself. And with that, we open up a new way to a form of natural Theology. What, after all, is natural theology, despite what I said to my mother? Is it the attempt to provide a neutral argument acceptable to all without presuppositions? Is it the attempt to sketch from a Christian point of view what such a neutral argument might look like if one existed? Or might it be a Christian account reading backwards like Jesus retelling Israel's story on the road? to show how the natural world had in fact been pointing, however brokenly, to the truth. It might try to be all of these, but it's the last of these that I think has most coherence, and that's what I'm attempting today. But what might natural theology be for, anyway? Those who invoked that category in the 19th century, 18th and 19th centuries, 
were often trying to construct an apologetic case on the assumption that people had given up believing in the Bible. They weren't going to take it from the clergy just saying, we have it on God's authority. They actually wanted to see how all this stuff worked out. They were trying to show, if not that Christianity was actually true, then at least that it was not unreasonable, because lots of people like David Hume had been saying no one in their right mind would believe that stuff. And there was also an explanatory case, more for consumption among the faithful, showing that the new scientific discoveries from the 18th and 19th century might actually, despite what people were saying, sit quite well alongside and even illustrate or illuminate traditional teaching. Often, and to this day this is the case, this was something of a rationalist aim, at least one remove from the gospel's central imperatives which include the offer of hope in suffering. And I want to argue a different and paradoxical point. Now, I've argued elsewhere that modern theology and exegesis have been shaped by particular assumptions about space, time, and human nature. About space, or the cosmos, by the Epicurean split of heaven and earth, in time, by the post-Renaissance chronological split between past and present and future, so it's difficult to get to and fro, and by understandings of human nature which are shaped by those two. This is a complicated argument. We don't need to go there particularly. But is, except to note that Israel's traditions presuppose a different way forward. In Israel's traditions, space, the cosmos, is seen in the temple where heaven and earth come together in a microcosmos, a little world which discloses God's purposes for the whole heaven and earth world. And likewise, in Israel's traditions, the Sabbath is the advance foretaste of the age to come so that somehow God's future leaps over that apparent gap. And humans in the middle of this are constituted as those who have the vocation to be image bearers. And these, in the New Testament, are then reshaped around Jesus and the Spirit. Unless we learn to think like this, we will struggle to say what we think we believe and what we mean by that in our world still today. The new shape still presupposes an integrated cosmos, heaven and earth, an inaugurated new creation, the future arrived in the present, and a vocational anthropology, Space, time, and humanness. Now, these three topics are reflected in the three broad approaches to natural theology over the last 300 years. For instance, famously, in Paley's Natural Theology of 1802, cosmology, teleology, and the human moral sense. These are the issues. And I want to land on the last one in particular. Immanuel Kant, in the Critique of Practical Reason, 1788, was able to use arguments about the cosmos and its goal, but he believed that what he called the inherently moral capacity of the human mind offered the strongest proof of God's existence. This was rejected by skeptics like John Stuart Mill on the grounds of evil and suffering in the world. You can have all the moral sense you like, but it looks as though actually that will tell you that if there's a God, he must be a bad God or something like that. And also by theologians like James McCosh, who were suspicious of Kant's moral intuitionism. How do you know? And preferred, like Paley, the more rational arguments from cosmology or teleology. This is where the well-known question of a point of contact comes in. Is there something in humans which provides a link to the divine? What hostages to fortune are we giving if we say that? That's then been foregrounded in much discussion, however misleadingly. But here and elsewhere, I believe that this moral argument, though important, has got out of focus. I've just signed a number of people's copies of my book, The Day the Revolution Began. And in that book, I argue that the platonic eschatology of Western Christianity, that's souls going to heaven rather than new heavens and new earth, that platonic eschatology has generated, generated a moralistic anthropology, my problem is sin, which then has produced a pagan soteriology. God so hated the world that he killed Jesus. So that in order to retrieve the biblical theology of the cross, hope in the midst of suffering, we need to unpick and rework each stage, not just the last one. 
And the problem comes particularly when anthropology is reduced from vocation simply to ethics, from calling to behavior. Of course, behavior matters. I have sometimes been accused of not caring about sin or not seeing sin as a power. That is totally wrong. Maybe I don't care enough about sin in my own life. That's another question. But as a theologian, <laughs> as a theologian, I care a lot about sin. Our primary vocation, which is to love God and our neighbor, must constantly be translated into motives and decisions and actions. And idolatry and the sin that it begets is the denial of our human vocation. But to be an image bearer, my friends, is more than simply behaving properly. Otherwise, we are putting the knowledge of good and evil before the knowledge of God. Indeed, the moral version of the natural theological argument might be thought to be running that risk from the start. The moral sense which Kant intuited, from which he thought to derive God as the ultimate moral being, is only part of a larger whole. And if you treat the part as the whole, it'll end in distortion. So I propose that we avoid the traps of the older construals of the image in terms of the human imagination or moral sense. The image in Scripture is primarily about vocation, about God creating one creature who is designed to stand within the great temple which is creation itself and there to reflect the wise stewardship of the Creator into the world and also to reflect the praises of creation back to the creator. The image is not just a mirror reflecting God back to God. It's reflecting God out into the world and the praises of the world back to God. Actually, once you get that straight, there's an awful lot of biblical theology, including Christology, which falls into place. Now, this vocation can be seen in the seven aspects I just mentioned. These don't form an exact replacement for Immanuel Kant's moral theory. I believe they straighten it out giving it a full-bodied sense of possibility which Kant's theory had lacked. So, the vocational signposts. There are seven features of human life which can be observed across different societies and times. I call them vocations, though they're often present as inarticulate aspirations and impulsions. We know them in our bones. The seven are a rather odd assortment. No apologies for that. I'm assigning loose labels to them which provide enough for the ongoing argument. And they take us to the heart of traditional questions about natural theology, but what we find there may be unexpected. So here are the seven, mixing my original four with three more. Justice, beauty, freedom, truth, and power, and spirituality and relationships. Those last two are slightly different from the first five, as we'll see. But the point about all seven is that we all know they matter, but we all have trouble with them. And indeed, that trouble is at the heart of much of the world's suffering, and it's there that we need to find hope in the midst. So take justice to start with. We all know that some things are fair and other things aren't. Children know this, believe me, I have grandchildren, <laughs> without studying moral philosophy. It's not fair. Where did you learn that? I just know it's not fair. <laughs> when a country signs a treaty and breaks it, we know it matters. If people think a criminal has got away with some criminal action, with a ridiculous light sentence, the hunger for justice sometimes leads people to vigilantism. Yet we are all prepared to bend or even ignore justice when it suits us. A good lawyer may get you off, however guilty you are. Countries with muscle force unjust trade deals on weaker partners. And people say there's no justice as a complaint against the system unless, like Machiavelli, you accept the Epicurean premise and know that this is just a game. This is the godless way the world works and you better learn how to play it. And the devil take the hindmost. Philosophically, never mind theologically, this is a counsel of despair. Here is the paradox. We all know justice matters, but why is it so hard to attain? Same paradox with beauty whether it's a sunset or a symphony, whether it's the smile of a child or a bunch of spring flowers. Beauty makes us more alive. We know it matters. If you live in a prison cell or the corporate prison cells of the brutalist buildings in old Eastern Europe, the stripping away of beauty is dehumanizing. 
But as with justice, even when we relish and celebrate beauty, it doesn't last. The sunset fades. The smiling child can become a bitter adult. The flowers wither. The music stops. The darkness closes in, making us wonder if what we thought was delight was just a random evolutionary quirk, a vestige of ancestral needs. Or whether, still worse, Jean-Paul Sartre was right, and the whole thing is just a sick joke at our expense. So we are drawn to beauty as to a magnet, but it disappears like a mirage. Why? You could say the same about freedom. We all know freedom matters. We all want it for ourselves and those for whom we care. But it's surprisingly difficult to define or to defend, to get or to keep. One person's freedom often comes at the cost of another person's slavery. Does it have to be a zero-sum game? Is our instinct for freedom merely a delusion? You see the paradox clearly in Jean-Jacques Rousseau 250 years ago. His version of Genesis 1 to 3 went, man is born free but is everywhere in chains. Now, a quarter of a millennium later... We are no closer to solving that problem. Or take truth. The Enlightenment boast of objectivity has been deconstructed by the postmodern claim that truth claims are power claims in disguise. But like people drinking poisoned water, we may suspect that the idea of objective truth is bad for us, but we're still thirsty. We still want to know the facts. We don't want to be surrounded by liars or to live in a hall of distorting mirrors. So being anxious with good reason about fraud, we want more paperwork for everything, more modernist truth markers to stave off postmodern suspicion. But like dropping bombs on terrorists, that just makes matters worse. We need truth. We were made to tell truth, but we live in a world of lies and Often we add to them ourselves. Now, all this leads to power. Power has been a dirty word in some circles, particularly since Nietzsche, on the one hand, claims to knowledge or claims to power, and Lord Axton, on the other, absolute power corrupts absolutely. But we can't do without power. Reformers and visionaries, realizing that evil thrives when good people do nothing, have grabbed the levers of power only to discover that either they don't work or they work in reverse. Nor is anarchy the answer. It merely opens the door to unscrupulous bullies. Nor is violence the answer. If you fight fire with fire, it's always fire that wins. We image bearers know that we are supposed to exercise God's rule, God's power in the world. Not that unbelievers would see it like that. But we regularly make matters worse. Now these first five, justice, beauty, freedom, truth and power are all, I suggest, vocations. They include moral intuition, but they go beyond it. They aren't just about our behavior, they are about the difference we are supposed to make in the world. But the final two take us into a rather different register, spirituality and relationships. Those are very, very slippery words, and actually that's why I choose them to be general. But we need to say something here. Spirituality. Secularism tried to rubbish spirituality. It's all just fantasy. But the secular dam has now broken and all forms of spirituality have flooded back. Many things from Dan Brown's fashionable Gnosticism to Ouija boards to forms of pantheistic mysticism, they are trying to bridge the gap left by the secular Epicureanism. Heaven's so far away and we're down here. They're trying to bridge that, borrowing bits and pieces from low-grade Platonism or Stoicism to get across. And people who go that route sometimes proudly declare that they are now religious, as though from a standing secular start, this puts them on the same map as Christianity. But Christians too face a problem. We have conceived of Christian spirituality in terms of our making our way to God or heaven, whereas the Jewish and Christian worldview focuses on the promise that God will come, has come, will come again to dwell with us. God in the midst of the world is the clue to hope in the midst of suffering. So new forms of spirituality let us down. They're regularly escapist. And even when we embrace the incarnational gospel, there are dark nights of the soul when it all goes blank. Yet another paradox. Paradox. 
finally relationships. Again, an appropriately slippery word. My point is not that there is something called love which we can analyze accurately and then ascribe to God, something we already know about, which then forms a window on the divine, but simply that all of us know we are made for relationships of one sort or another. We are all, for good and ill, formed by those relationships, whether they're supportive or abusive or healthy or unhealthy. And often the abusive and unhealthy relationships are the ones to which we return like addicts. But here then is the final paradox. We humans become the people we are, as Wolfhard Pannenberg argued, through the relationships we have outside of ourselves. And yet we mess up those relationships and we are messed up by them. The very best still end in death itself. These seven then I see as signposts. As they stand, they are broken signposts, promising much but apparently failing to deliver. One might, of course, try to argue from them all up to some sort of natural theology. You could suggest that the passion for justice and the love of beauty makes sense within a world which God has promised to put right, a world which he will fill with his glory. You could say that. Our longing for freedom could be said to resonate with Scripture's Exodus theme. That's true, it does. We could rightly say that the Creator God is the God of truth, of reality who calls his human image bearers to be truth tellers so that his wise order may come and come again into his world. Human puzzles about power might be seen to reflect the constant biblical theme of God's power and the human quest for spirituality in all its forms points to Augustine's, Augustine's line that you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they rest in you. And finally, our need for multi-leveled relationships might be seen as a window onto the pluriform relationships within the triune God himself and on our ultimate vocation to love God and love our neighbor. And from all this then, as a kind of refreshed version of Kant's moral intuitionism, we might hope to argue our way up to God, perhaps even to the father of Messiah Jesus. And working out from there, we might then hope to incorporate some version of the cosmological and teleological arguments. Our own creativity might be seen as a mirror of the creator's own intentions, and our own hopes and goals might reflect the sense of ultimate purpose built into the world we know. We might think all this, but we would be walking out on a frozen lake and the ice is thin. You can imagine Richard Dawkins, in his usual sneering response to a post natural theology, dismissing it all as projection. Your God is rather like you, only bigger. Throw in some Freud and Marx and Nietzsche, and the ice cracks. However deeply rooted these vocations may seem to be, they may just be memes transferred across cultures and times. But that's not all. Deeper than the cynic's sneer is our own analysis that we have failed individually and corporately. We have turned justice into oppression, beauty into keech, freedom into license, truth into fake news, power into bullying. We have sought self-gratifying spiritualities. We have made the calling to relationships the excuse for exploitation. All these, from a Christian point of view, have the word idolatry hanging over them. It gets worse again. Even when we haven't got it wrong, when we have done justice, loved beauty, given and sustained freedom, told the truth, exercised power with wise restraint, and sought the true God with all our hearts and souls and our neighbors as ourselves, why then entropy kicks in? This is John Stuart Mill's response to Kant. However much you puff up the human moral capacity, and in my version, however much you emphasize vocational qualities common to all humans, then events in the world from earthquakes to gas chambers, events in our hearts and lives, and the harsh fact that we all die. And life seems a cruel joke. All this suggests that any new version of the moral argument will fail the test of theodicy. The moral argument, even in my new form, falls through the ice and drowns. So the seven vocations are at best broken signposts. They appear to be pointing somewhere, but they lead into the dark or over a cliff or round in circles to where we began. Were they just wraiths, the ghosts of our own imaginings? Were they just random impulses in a late developed evolutionary pattern? 
Were they, after all, the wrong questions to ask? Should we simply have capitulated to the cool, contemporary, epicurean cynicism? Yes, yes, we feel these things, but they don't really mean anything, and we should silence such irrelevant voices and pursue the placid pleasures available to us here and now. Or should we smile an, earth, an early Bartian smile and say, well, there you are, nothing good was ever going to come from all that anyway. So can these seven vocational imperatives play any role as pointers to the reality or the character of God? I think they can, but only if we move the argument forward in perhaps an unexpected way. Our discovery that the apparently promising signposts were broken takes us back to where we began with Jesus' teasing rebuke to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You are so senseless. Didn't you realize this is how it had to happen? What was going on? Richard Hayes, probably, I'll say this in his absence, the greatest contemporary American New Testament scholar, has reminded us that the early Christians read Israel's scriptures backwards. They didn't start with the Bible, figure out an identical picture of a Messiah, and then discover Jesus of Nazareth. They had plenty of scripture-based messianic portraits, and Jesus didn't look like any of them. But notice what Jesus does not do. He doesn't say, why were you bothering with those scriptures? They just led you into trouble with wrong views of God and salvation. Chuck them away and trust me for the brand new thing I'm promising. No, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, says Luke. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Here is the truth which cuts across the different philosophical and theological movements that have tried to do natural theology on the one hand and historical studies of Jesus and the Gospels on the other. When you look back from the resurrection of the crucified one to the hopes and aspirations of Israel, and as I shall now argue, to the seven vocational signposts that we've studied. You do not see a void. You see a broken, desolate story, limping along, faint but pursuing, stumbling into the ditch here and there, taking wrong turnings, grabbing at false solutions, and hanging on to empty hopes. But still it comes, in tears like the women at the tomb, in sorrow like the two on the Emmaus road. And behind that broken and bleeding story, we glimpse the narrative of Israel's vocation. Abraham's call and covenant, Moses' exodus and tabernacle, David's and Solomon's victories and temple, the catastrophe of exile, and the long, dark promises of restoration. When you read backwards from cross and resurrection, you see muddle and failure and mistake, but you also see the divine promises and vocations to which, however partially and fitfully, Israel kept returning. And you now see, in a way you couldn't before, that this was the right story to be telling. That those were the right signals, if only you could have steered by them. That what Israel's God has now done is, has, as it were, retrospectively validated all that had gone before. So the so-called apocalyptic rejection of any backstory which reflects Kierkegaard's and Barth's rejection of Hegel. A few footnotes necessary there, never mind if you didn't get that. The, the rejection of any backstory throws out the teapot with the tea leaves, a good British uh, metaphor there. <laughs> is, Israel's story is the story of God's faithfulness. And as Paul unerringly saw, the very brokenness of that story magnifies that faithfulness. To say otherwise lands you in the arms of Marcion, where you will find many friends, ancient and modern. Nor will you worry about natural theology there. Marcionites like Gnostics don't want to be told that the story of Israel having snapped in two like a dry twig, nevertheless still pointed in the right direction. When you learn to read backwards, you will glimpse like the father seeing his bedraggled son limping over the horizon, you will glimpse the story that got it all wrong and yet found its way home. So it is with the broken signposts that we've noted. By themselves, they do not point upwards to God. Or if they seem to, they might simply be building a new tower of Babel. 
They can be deconstructed. They can be interpreted otherwise. And yet, at the very moment of their failure, they point to the ultimate broken signpost, which turns out to be the place in real life, in concrete history, where the living God is truly revealed and known and loved. Each of those broken signposts leads to the same place, to the foot of the cross. Think about it. The cry for justice is central to Israel's prayer life. The boast of justice was central to imperial Rome, but it didn't work. When push came to shove, everybody knew Jesus was innocent. Pilate washed his hands. His wife had nightmares about that just man. Beauty is elusive in the Bible. According to Psalm 65, the mornings and evenings praise God because twilight invests everything with glory. But as Jesus dies, there is no twilight, only darkness, and in the morning, only horror. Jesus died at Passover time, freedom time, and the Romans stamped on freedom as only they knew how. Jesus explains to Pilate that his kingdom is all about truth-telling, and Pilate, sneering, says, what is truth? Empires make their own truth. Truth is the first casualty in war and the final irony of the crucifixion. So too with power. Jesus had announced a new kind of power, the power of love, but it seemed that the old kind had won after all. Spirituality, the dark night at noon, gives its answer, my God, why did you abandon me? Relationships, Judas denies Jesus, Peter betrays him, the rest run away, and people say he saved others, he can't save himself. When we stand at the foot of the cross, all seven signposts appear broken beyond repair. The gospel story confirms the cynic's view. There is no way up to God from there. But when we read backwards, we discover that this was the point when the true God was revealed. If we thought that the human vocations would lead us on a noble upward path to God, we were all along wanting, as perhaps Kant was wanting, to find the God of the omnis, the omnicompetent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient deity, the celestial CEO of much Western imagination. Instead... The four Gospels tell us about the God who suffered the ultimate injustice, the God who had no beauty that we should desire him, the incarnate God who was denied freedom, whose fresh truth was trumped by the empire's truth-making machine. The Messiah who healed by the power of love was crushed by the love of power. The one whose own rich spirituality bound him in intimate relationship to the Father found himself abandoned. Here then is the point. The early Christians all insist, not that the divine revelation took place simply before this in Jesus' public career or after it in the resurrection. Yes, it's there too, but John insists that Good Friday afternoon was when they gazed upon his glory, glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And the point is this. If we go looking for a God who matches our culture's expectations, we may get the wrong God. There is only one God like this. The First World War poet Edward Shillito, his best-known poem is called Jesus of the Scars, and the final stanza goes like this. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak, and not a God has wounds but thou alone. Of course, none of this was apparent at the time. Nobody that evening on Good Friday was saying, well, that was very unpleasant, but at least now we have seen God's glory. No. (laughs) Jesus' Jesus' followers were hiding in shame and fear and grief, but the resurrection compelled them to look back and to retell the story so that not only Israel's broken story, but the broken signposts from the entire human world turned out, after all, precisely in their brokenness to be pointing to the ultimate broken signpost, the snapped twig, the cross itself. So what kind of natural theology might now emerge 
for our, from our investigation of human vocation. Five quick points as we move towards a conclusion. First, the early Christians made these signposts thematic for their own ongoing life. They looked back in the light of the new day which had dawned and they declared that God had established his justice in the world and that he would complete this at Jesus' return. Their visions and poems, their common life and their shared love radiated a beauty which turned into world-transforming art and music, poetry and drama. They embraced the freedom of the new exodus and they lived by it. They spoke a lot about truth and through their words, the truth of new creation spread into the world. They spoke and acted with a healing restorative power. They practiced a spirituality that could cope with the darkest night of the soul while being open to rich, multi-layered experiences of the God in whose image they found themselves remade. And above all, in their rich relationships, they turned the ancient rumor of love into practical policy, caring for one another and for anyone, especially the poor, that their outstretched hands could reach. All this was the common coin of early Christian life. Now, the Enlightenment has done its best to rubbish church history, to see it as part of the problem. Most recently, Stephen Pinker in his book, Enlightenment Now, forget the church, we're doing it. We are making the world a better place. And of course, the church has failed and sinned and hated and used violence and colluded with wickedness. But at the same time, the ordinary life of ordinary Jesus followers is still the principal way that people are drawn to faith, not least because these seven signposts have been mended. And when, in other words, we look back from Easter and Pentecost, we see with hindsight that those were the right questions to be asking. The Epicurean cynicism of a Machiavelli or a Nietzsche is answered. The signposts may have been broken, but they were doing their best to tell the truth. You can't start with them and argue your way up to God's existence or character. But when in Jesus and his resurrection you discern the first light of new creation's dawn, you see that the signposts were telling us something true, even though they could only be seen through a glass darkly. Now that we have the new answers, we see that those were the right questions. They were not simply the frantic ravings of random desires. The signposts were intending to point to a country where, astonishingly, we are now welcomed as citizens. Second, we have a new angle on this whole business of a point of contact between humans and God, or between God and the world. That phrase is unfortunate because it seems to suggest a merely tangential meeting. And to be sure, if by point of contact we were thinking of an upward ladder, a progressive movement of mind or heart by which we could climb up to God, we find that the ladder has no rungs. Instead, the Gospels show us an event within the public world, within the world of history, of humans, of power politics and power games and kangaroo courts. The cross of Jesus is the ultimate, ultimate signpost to God, to God's work in the world, to God's purposes for the world, and indeed to God's ultimate dealing with evil in the world. The trail of broken signposts leads to the broken God on the cross. This is no mere incidental fact, das, as in Bultmann, a bare fact. No, the cross planted in the solid ground of human history, in the natural world of blood and soil, is the signpost that simultaneously says no to all human pride and folly, and yes to all those vocational longings. The temple veil is torn, and on the silent Sabbath of Holy Saturday, God lies buried in the heart of the earth. All four Gospels are telling us, in language more familiar to first century Jews than to fourth century or 13th century or 16th or 19th century theologians, that here heaven and earth overlapped entirely. So if natural theology is looking for a God other than the one nailed to the cross, it's looking, however accidentally, for an idol and needs to be reminded that our knowledge of God is the reflex of God's knowledge for, of us and that this is to be energized by love. The cross of Jesus belongs totally within the natural world. That's the sort of thing that humans do to one another. 
the world of nature red in tooth and claw, including human nature in Orwell's terrible image of a boot stamping on a human face forever. But when we look at this event from the angles we've now explored, we can say with quiet and grateful confidence that here the living God is truly revealed. When we look at the cross and see there precisely the failed hopes and the despairing cries of history, we discover the deepest truth, that the meeting point is not where humans raise themselves up on tiptoe and God stretches down for a brief moment. The cross is where the downward spiral of human despair meets the love which was all along at the heart of creation. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down thing. And that is why I think even to the cynical and doubting, paintings and other depictions of the cross retain a pre-articulate and sub-rational power which the theologian can bring to rational articulation. And that's why hard-boiled atheists still turn out to performances of Bach's passions. The music itself functions as a kind of natural theology. This was apparent in a couple of incidents I noted near the start of the day the revolution began. First in 2000, the National Gallery in London hosted an exhibition put on by its then director, Neil McGregor, who was a Christian. It was called Seeing Salvation, consisting mostly of old paintings depicting Jesus' death. The newspapers and critics rubbished it. Why do we have to look at all those grisly old pictures about someone dying? But the general public ignored the critics and came in their droves over and over again. The power of the cross still speaks across cultural barriers. Take the example of the former Cardinal Archbishop of Paris, Jean-Marie Lustiger. He told the story of three young lads in a provincial town playing a trick on the priest. They went into the confessional and confessed all kinds of sins they'd just made up. The first two ran away laughing, but the priest, having heard the confession of the third, gave him a penance to perform. He said, I want you to walk up to that great crucifix at the far, far end of the church, look at the figure on the cross and say, you did all that for me and I don't give a damn. And do it three times. So the lad went off. It was all part of the game. And looking at the crucifix, he said, you did all that for me and I don't give a damn. Then he said it again. Then he couldn't say it the third time. He broke down and he left the church changed and humbled and transformed. And Archbishop Lustiger telling this story finished by saying, the reason I know that story is that I was that young man. The cross can speak to the hardest heart. And third, the perspective I've offered provides a fresh way back into a cosmological argument. Now, famously, Paley spoke of the watch and the implied watchmaker. If you find a watch, there must have been a watchmaker and all of that. You know that stuff. We might want to speak of new creation, of discerning the dawn, of seeing a broken watch repaired and telling the new time demanded by the new world which had been born. Like the French revolutionaries restarting the calendar, the events concerning Jesus have fixed the watch and set it on to new time. If Jesus is the true temple, we can begin to explore afresh the coming together between him and the cosmos. The power of the argument will then depend on the extent to which the new time makes sense in the lives of puzzled onlookers, and that points to the mission and life of the church. And fourth, the same is true of the teleological argument. It isn't just that we can look at organisms and hypothesize a goal towards, towards which they're tending. The resurrection validates retrospectively those hints of forward-looking deductions. If Jesus has inaugurated the great age to come, the great Sabbath, we can think differently about all human and global pathways and goals. And part of the point, as we might have guessed from the Psalms and Isaiah, is that the ultimate goal of all creation can now be realized. We glimpse the future, heaven and earth coming together. Ephesians 1, Paul says, God's plan always was to sum up all things in heaven and on earth in the Messiah. We glimpse that, and we realize that the signposts, broken as they were, were nonetheless telling the truth. And fifth, the focus on the cross addresses the question of theodicy in a fresh way. Ever since the 18th century, the problem of evil has been split off from atonement theology as though the cross, which is central to the latter, was irrelevant to the former. I have suggested that a vocational version of the moral argument for natural theology 
brings us back after all to the cross. It's time for those two questions to be reunited. And sixth and finally, we gain a new understanding of knowledge itself. If, as Ludwig Wittgenstein remarkably said, it is love that believes the resurrection, it is love itself, in Christian terms, the love of God poured out into our hearts that enables us to see the larger picture as well. Love in believing the resurrection discovers with it that the signs of the Creator's presence in the old creation really were true pointers to the new. Love is the mode of knowing, which includes, though it transcends, all the others. With this, we discover a particular twist at the end of the argument. When we look back at the broken story and the broken signposts and that those who have struggled and puzzled to make sense of it all, we remind ourselves that grief, too, is a form of love. I've often had to say this to people grieving at funerals. Grief is a form of love. And so shares its epistemological possibility. Mary saw the angel and then the risen Jesus through her tears. Those who have loved justice and beauty and freedom and the rest and have grieved over their denial have had all along true knowledge of the true God who gave us those vocations. I think that's part of what the Sermon on the Mount's about. The Platonic tradition would have downgraded that to just belief rather than knowledge. I think we should upgrade it again. Not merely by saying it's justified belief. Blessed are those who mourn, said Jesus. They shall be comforted. I think that works with epistemology as well. So to conclude, I have implicitly rejected the working assumption behind some attempts at natural theology, the, the assumption that from within an idolatrous or even Faustian world, one could by reason alone storm the heights and reach the citadel. That, of course, was what Karl Barth was reacting against, a natural theology achieved with force and power that would sustain a political system based on force and power. Instead, I'm suggesting a natural theology of weakness, corresponding to Paul's theology of weakness in 2 Corinthians. Barth's alternative, a revelation vertically from above, was itself potentially problematic with its implications of powerful preaching from a high pulpit. I'm glad I'm standing at the bottom of this slope, not at the top. <laughs> Paul's apostolic preaching was framed by apostolic weakness, embodying the gospel in apostolic suffering. And the natural theology revealed when we read backwards to the cross and thence to the broken signposts, can never be a rationalist's triumphalism. It is known by love, and love must be its modus operandi. And this kind of natural theology does indeed affirm that right there in the world, knowable by genuine history, there is the true revelation of the true God. But the revelation itself, consisting in the shocking event of the cross, as seen in the light of the resurrection, at once deconstructs any possibility that this natural theology might embody or provide an excuse for a theology or a politics of power and domination. In retrospectively validating the seven broken signposts, the cross firmly insists that all of them point to the God of generous love. That's why the early Christian new creational eschatology rooted in history must issue in the flesh and blood missio dei, mission of God. That's part of the argument. The signposts must come to life afresh. When we fight for justice and stand up for the oppressed, we are knowing God and making him known. We are demonstrating by the Spirit his own passion for justice. When we delight in beauty and create more of it, God the glad creator is delighted. When we cherish freedom and share it, when we speak truly, especially when we speak new creation into being by articulating fresh truth, the God of Genesis and Exodus is present and celebrated and known. And when we exercise power and authority humbly and wisely and hold to account those who do otherwise, we are living out publicly the power of the cross. And when we worship and pray, and above all, when we enter into wise, self-giving and fruitful relationships, we are knowing and honoring the God of creation and making him known. There will be grief in this. There will be love in this. There will thus be knowledge. We will be engaged in the true image-bearing natural theology. Those who discern the dawn must awaken the world. Such an image-bearing mission 
shaped by temple cosmology and Sabbath eschatology focused on Jesus, such an image-bearing mission will be oriented towards the ultimate goal when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Natural theology has sometimes tried to gain that goal without going through the dark valley. But when the epistemology of love gives birth to the missiology of love, even the broken signposts will laugh and sing for joy. Thank you very much.